My name is Matthew Salcedo. I work at uh, UNM Rainforest Innovations, uh, running the University Center Program, which is the sponsor for this webinar series. Uh, we do web webinars every month, and we publish information about them to our Eventbrite pages, our website, and also our LinkedIn and Facebook pages as well. Um, I just want to remind everyone that um, this webinar series is a part of uh, our broader program that culminates in the Entrepreneurial Capability Certificate, which is a certificate for new uh, entrepreneurs who are interested in broadening their startup skills. Um, if you view seven of these webinars, and they don't have to be live, we also record each of these webinars and post them to our website, and complete the seven associated quizzes, um, you can go ahead and uh, earn that certificate, which is very useful when talking to investors or outside parties. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be putting my email in the chat, and I'll also go ahead and include a link to that page as well. Um, but other than that, um, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Fleckner. And uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to either raise your hand or you can put them in the chat. And uh, either I or Dr. Fleckner will uh, yeah. stop things to address them. Yeah. It's like... Okay. Can I ask everyone who isn't um, asking a question to go on mute so we don't have background noise? And I do apologize if my dog starts to go nuts um, when my kids get home. <laughs> I will try to <laughs> prevent that from happening. Um, but yes, I'm Jess Fleckner. It's really nice to be able to e meet you and present to you today a little bit about my background and um, my topic of creating a biotechnology company. I would love for this to be a dialogue. So if you have questions, raise your hand, shout out, write them in the chat. I'll try to pay attention to that when I'm uh, speaking. And so the agenda today is really going to be first just my biography so you understand who I am, where I come from, and why I might have something to say about this. Um, and then I'll get into how to launch a biotechnology startup uh, from my experience. I'll give you a case study on the company where I spent the past 15 years, which was Genosha. And then I'll end with what I believe that investors in big pharma care about. Um, all of this presentation is through my lens. So I just want to make sure you understand that it's um, my opinion with some facts mixed in, and I reference facts where I found them. So my background is that I'm currently living in Massachusetts, but we are moving, moving to Albuquerque. Uh, my husband is currently living there. He works for ARA. I was born in Wisconsin, and I was raised in Ohio and Connecticut. I have a background in a bachelor's in animal science a doctorate in cellular immunology with minors in reproductive physiology and immunogenetics, and my postdoctoral training was in immunology. Uh, so those are all just facts and figures. The most important thing to me is my family. I already told you that my husband is there in um, New Mexico, and I have two boys who are 18 and 16. So let me tell you about my career path. Um, I performed my doctorate at Cornell, as I mentioned, and I was studying reproductive immunology. Horses are really cool. I was using horses as a model. Um, the baby expresses half the mom's genes and half the dad's genes while it's cooking in the mom. And uh, in horses, they're not invisible. In fact, the, the moms make whopping antibody responses against their babies, and yet they don't reject their babies. And so my whole thesis was studying why um, the females, what happens to their immune system to allow them to create these, these um, immune responses against the baby, but not reject it. Uh, after I finished my doctorate, I went to a postdoc at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute that's in Boston. And I went from horses to mice, which was shocking. Um, you can literally bleed or collect blood to study lymphocytes from a horse and you can take a liter and they're fine. They're perfectly happy standing and eating. And when I went to a mouse to study their lymphocytes, you could take 100 microliters and they're feeling faint. <laughs> so I had to learn how to change the way that I did my work in order to adapt to a different species. Um, the best benefit of Dana-Farber for me was helping to solidify that I didn't want to be in academia. Um, there's nothing wrong with academia, but I was seeing all these patients 
And I was feeling that the research that I was doing there, which was gathering basic information on science, wasn't being applied. I wasn't helping these patients who I was eating in the cafeteria with. And so I chose to go into industry because I thought that I could have a clearer path to taking science and creating medicines that would ultimately help patients. So I left Dana-Farber and I went to a startup company in New York called Mojave Therapeutics. Mojave was really fun. I was the 23rd employee, so it was a small, tiny company. We were trying to create vaccines to treat cancer, melanoma in particular. And um, we had engineered a way that we could um, deliver melanoma tar like antigens, the things that the immune system needs to recognize, into human subjects using something called heat shock proteins as a chaperone. And so we were trying to make a non-conventional vaccine to treat cancer. Uh, Mojave needed to raise money right after September 11th happened. And as a result, we couldn't. The money had just dried up for biotech right at that time. But the net effect of that was that their intellectual property was acquired by a company here in Massachusetts called Antigenic, which is now Agenis. They renamed themselves. I went from humans back to mice, but I got to go with the technology and I got to continue to develop this idea of using heat shock proteins as a chaperone for vaccination, um, both for infectious disease and for cancer. And interestingly, as a release test for a different vaccine, which is something that I had never thought needed to happen, much less that I would be able to create. So I left Antigenics or Agenis when uh, their phase three program failed in the clinic and they did massive layoffs for the company. And I joined another small company here in Massachusetts called BioVest International as a consultant. BioVest was really ahead of their time. They were creating personalized cancer vaccines to treat follicular, follicular lymphoma, also known as non-Hodgkin's non lymphoma. And what was really interesting was they were making, so all the cancer cells in the patients have antibody on their surface. It's a B cell tumor. So they were making antibodies against the antibodies. They're called anti-idiotypic antibodies and vaccinating the patients with antibodies against their tumor. So the immune system would attack their own cancer cells, but not their normal B cells. It was really a great experience. As I said, I was just consulting there. And while I was there, I was recruited to join Genosha um, and go back to human subjects research. And I'll tell you a lot more about Genosha in the second half of this presentation. So uh, can I answer any questions on my background or should we just move on? Okay. So from where do biotechnology startup companies originate? Uh, since you, many of you are in the university setting, the first one will seem obvious, but there are a lot of other options that you should really know about, especially if you're an entrepreneur without a, a product. So on the left side, the most common, as you're aware, is university labs. And so in this case, uh, uh, academic will have an invention. That invention will be in license into the new company out of the university in order to create that company. And then the company will continue to develop it um, and hopefully ultimately market the invention to the public. The other, the next option is from government labs. And uh, this is where the company will see something really interesting that was developed at the NIH or the CDC or the DOD, some government lab where they cannot do for-profit work unless it's a creative, but that's a longer story. But you can in-license their invention into your company to do the for-profit work. So two good examples of this. One is um, I'm aware of a company that was um, created based on an adjuvant technology that was developed at the NIH. That company is called Avidia. It's an adjuvant system that they out-licensed from the NIH uh, several years ago. And I think just last year, they were acquired by Vaxitech. So that, that was a good ending for that company. They took the technology out, they continued to develop it, and then they were bought. The other one you may be aware of is a company called Iovan. They are a um, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte transfer company. 
companies. So they take tumors out of patients. They cause the lymphocytes to grow out of the tumors in the test tube in the laboratory. They grow them up to very large numbers. And then they put those lymphocytes back into the cancer patient, the same cancer patient, to treat them. And that was technology that was developed at the NCI by Dr. Rosenberg. So this is very tenable, and it's a path that could be taken. The third is from large corporations. So all the time, large corporations have really good ideas. Let's say they have a vir antiviral drug program. And then um, after 10 years of great work and even great data, the corporation decides that they no longer want to be in the antiviral business. So it isn't that the product failed, it's just that the business mission changed for that corporation. And what they will do is then perhaps sell the technology to an entity who wants to continue to develop it for themselves. So that is an option. The fourth, and this is gaining traction, is venture grown. So this is completely new technologies that are built entirely by a venture organization. So they, um, the venture firm will build its own incubator space. It will have these inklings of ideas where they have scientists internally develop those ideas to create the companies, and then the companies to create the products, and then the products get sold. And some of you may have heard of, oh, this little company called Moderna. Um, that is an example of one of the companies that were venture grown. And it was grown by a company called Flagship Pioneering. So it was entirely grown internally by Flagship until it was spun out into a company and then the company made the COVID vaccine, one of the companies that made the COVID vaccine. And the last is your garage. And I'm being sincere, <laughs> although I did put a snarky comment in here. Um, it is true. You can have a great idea and you can develop it and patent it from your house or your basement or your garage. And you can start a company with that invention. It is not unheard of. I actually know someone who has done this. He is a, a professor, but he also had this idea that was not core to his um, laboratory in the university. He developed it himself in his spare time, and now he has a company that is going based on that. So you have options. And to quote Jack Lemon, failure seldom stops you. What stops you is the fear of failure. So let's not let that stop us as we think about starting a new company. So starting companies are difficult, is difficult. Um, according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, 90% of new businesses fail. So that number, by the way, there's all kinds of different people who throw out different numbers. Um, this one you can find reference, but some people say it's 60%, some say it's 80, 95, but it's in that ballpark. The expectation is that the majority fail. And in fact, 10% fail within the first year and then the number increases over time. The majority of failed businesses will fail within their first 10 years. And it's true, if you're out there marketing this to investors or to collaborators, people are gonna laugh at you. They're gonna close the door on you. They're not gonna answer your call. They might tell you that your idea is not smart. They might just not believe the science that you're building, but it shouldn't stop you as long as you know that it's credible and that you see and you have a vision for how it's going to be used. It is a roller coaster ride. There's very little stability early on. Um, there's a lot of stress and a lot of lack of sleep. Uh, it has to be something that you're comfortable with. And there's financial secure insecurity of will I get a paycheck next month? I can speak from experience. My husband worked at a startup company after he finished his doctorate where um, they were unable to close their funding, but they needed to get to a next value inflection point in order to raise more money. And so he actually worked for them for free because he believed so much in what they were doing and that if they got to that value inflection point, they would be able to raise money on it. So it is very real that especially in very new startups, there's times where you may not get a paycheck. But the reward can be substantial. Freedom. When you start a company, at least early on, you're your own boss. Ultimately, you get a board, you get an SAB, you get investors, and then they become your bosses. But early on, you're your own boss. It's your idea. It's your vision. 
it's how you want to develop your product in order to help society um, in the case of biotech. The benefits are that it's the hard work that you're doing, the sleepless night, it benefits you. It's not benefiting you know, the man or whoever you believe is, is oppressing you. <laughs> it's your work, it's your vision, it's your science, it's your product. And the converse of what I told you about the roller coaster ride, there are valleys, but there are also really high peaks. The first time that we took a product that I had helped create into the clinic and helped the patient was probably one of the most rewarding days of my life after the birth of my children. It was, it, the highs are high. And the risk can equal the reward. Um, it is possible that if you go public, if you get bought, that the financial compensation can be pretty tremendous. And I want you to know that the, each of the Forbes richest 25 Americans is an entrepreneur themselves or an heir to an entrepreneur's fortune. So there's something to be said for the um, possibilities that exist for new companies. So what are your fundraising choices? And what I did was I ordered them based on the fastest way to get money, credibly, <laughs> to the slowest. But um, we'll walk through each of them. Um, and I'm sure there are more. And often, as we did, it's combinations of these four things. But here are the four big buckets. The first is angel investors. So this is usually the fastest path to money for the company. Um, it is people who might put in a small amount. Let's say in total, you raise a million dollars from angels. And that is good. It can help you get to the next value inflection point, get you to enough data, which I'll tell you about what you probably need to start a company officially or to get it off the ground and get big payout. Um, it's enough to get you to that point where you can then go to the venture capitalist or you can go to the corporate partners and say, look what I have. It's time to come in and, and share the um, vision with me. The challenge with angel investors is unlike venture capitalists who have a lot of money in general to put to work for particular companies that they invest in, it's usually a one-time deal. Um, most of them don't plan to put continue money into your company aside from that initial slug of financing. And so um, it's just, you can't count on them in the future, you're gonna to have to find other dollars. Sometimes angel investors can result in higher valuations. I don't know why, so this is probably not something that you should ask me about, but it is something that I have seen happen and I don't understand the business part of that. So the second one is venture capitalists. This is fast money in the grand scheme of things. Um, as I was introducing, usually venture capitalists will invest in you, let's say it's your series A, your first major round of investment, and they will put in $5 million. They also have a fund that they have you know, put aside in their bank. And let's say they have an additional $10 million there that's just earmarked to you. It's not necessarily gonna go to you, but they're holding it in reserve so that if you meet your milestone, from the first round of funding, they may be willing to dip into that earmarked pool and continue to fund you through your Series B or your Series C or however long you're gonna do private financing. So they usually have a little bit of more money to put to work for you if you are successful and meet your milestones and bring forward um, all of the things that you promised to do when they funded you the first time. The other benefit of the venture capitalists is they are experts in building companies. They have done this before. They know all the pitfalls. They know how to find a network that can help you, including your SAB, Scientific Advisory Board, including your board of directors. And um, sometimes they can have um, what they call venture partners who actually come in and take an operating role in your company. For example, maybe are the first CEO until you find your permanent CEO. And so that's a really big value that comes with venture capitalists. The next option is a corporate partner. It is slower money, and it's mostly just the amount of time that it takes to negotiate the work plan and the licenses and how you're gonna handle intellectual property and just getting the agreements done. 
um, it is a benefit because when a corporate partner um, invests in small companies, they tend to believe in the vision that you have built. And it is perceived as external validation that somebody who knows the science, knows the field, believes in what you're building and are willing to come in early and help you pay for it. The challenges of corporate partnerships are that um, they move slowly, corporate, big corporations I'm talking about. Um, and there is a risk of giving your technology away too early. For example, if you wait a couple of years and you get further along or maybe even a clinical trial done, the value that would be ascribed to you from even a corporate partner would be increased relative to what it was today. And you could be perceived as a fee for service, um, which isn't always a bad thing, but it usually isn't something that um, small companies like to do because you don't get any of the intellectual property that comes from having a, com a company pay you um, to do work that is their idea. So, um, there are pros and cons. <laughs> and then finally, grants. Um, grants are the slowest money. You know, you, you apply for a grant, it's usually not a huge dollar amount. Um, it goes through review, often you have to do a revision and then another review, et cetera. So it just takes a little bit longer time to get that capital into your organization. Um, the benefit is that there's no dilution. Nobody owns you um, except yourself. It's all money that can just be applied to your science and it's your IP. Um, there can be IP issues depending on who the granting agency is. Um, so, you know, NIH usually doesn't have any IP provisions, but if you do um, agreements with other for-profit companies or even maybe the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they might want, if they put ideas into the work plan that they have funded, there is joint IP that would come from that collaboration. Um, but what we did is we could use grant money which is really important to fund non-core programs, things that we think that the technology could help us achieve, um, but that doesn't have a big market. The venture capitalists might not be interested in. And so it was a really good way to continue to grow the technology and use that capital to do good science and build the platform with other money being used to build the lead product that would ultimately get sold. So I've said a lot of words. Can I answer any questions on these four big buckets of fundraising? Okay. So to quote Gandhi, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. So let's talk about when you're ready to talk to investors. And I'm talking about biotech here. So first, you need some kind of technology. I wrote platform here. It doesn't have to be a platform. It could be, let's say, you have a candidate vaccine that you're going to use to treat COVID. That's great. And it may be something that a company wants to invest in. But it can't be, you have to be able to have the vision of not only using this construct to create a COVID vaccine, but how you might then tweak it to apply it to flu or apply it to hepatitis C or some other disease so that you're not just a single product entity. Most company, most um, investors want to see not only that you're going to have a product, but that you have a pipeline of products behind that concept. You need strong intellectual property. You have to have patent applications at least or issued patents that will protect the technology that you're going to develop commercially because you can't you don't want to do all this work and then have somebody swoop in and build it themselves and sell it um, out from underneath you it's very tricky intellectual property because you don't also want to file too early and have issued patents too early because there's a patent life and if you think that it takes at least 10 years to get through clinical trials before you can even market a product and your patent life, I actually don't know what it is. I think it's 25 years. It just means that you have a narrow window where you can actually sell your product without anybody coming in and making a generic. So you just have to be careful about the patent life. You need early proof of concept. 
Usually this is in animals. If it's in humans, it's even better. But you need more than just the idea. You have to show that you've been able to put it into practice in some way and that your idea has legs. You need a visionary founder. I don't mean that you need you know, a guru sitting on a hill. I mean that you have to have the person or people who are involved in your science or your technology who really say, you know what, I think we can build something with this. I think that we could create a vaccine or a cell therapy or a drug and that people are gonna wanna buy it. Let's go talk and find out how to get this company started. You do need publication. Peer review is the biggest thing that people look for, investors in particular, to show that other people have kicked the tires on your technology and that they also believe that what you've created is real. And finally, you need a growing industry and an unmet need. Um, it won't do you any good, I don't think, to make like a product to treat scurvy because it's not really a problem anymore. Good nutrition does that. But if you have a cure for cancer, yeah, people are gonna buy that. And so it can't, you have to really understand that what you're building is something that people are gonna wanna buy. So I talked a little bit about sources of funding, but I wanna dive just a touch deeper. Um, SBIR grants are wonderful entities. They do give you money to help you maybe establish that proof of concept that I was talking about in animals or bridge some manufacturing gap that you have, you know, to try to figure out how to make your, um, your product. But I want to um, reinforce that they're generally small money. And um, in biotech, a ton of money just goes to pay the staff. And so, um, if you have a phase one SBIR, and let's say you get the $250,000 that is part of that um, funding, it won't go very far. It won't pay salaries. It won't help you do um, single cell RNA seq. I mean, there, there are really expensive things that happen in the biotech industry that um, an SBIR might not be enough to cover. However, it is enough to supplement. And again, I say, if you have investors that are paying for your core concept, a new product, and you have an idea to use that same product to build widgets, get your SBIR to build the widgets while you're using your venture dollars to pay for your big idea, your big product. So for the corporate deals, there's the joint research and development grants. They're often called option agreements. And in this case, the corporation agrees to finance a project plan. Um, it is in your interest to completely write the project plan yourself so that all of the invention is yours. But no matter what, you have to negotiate it. You they will say, we don't like this milestone, we don't like this timeline, add this, take that out. And it's called an option agreement because it means that after you finish all of the milestones that they funded, that corporation has the option to take the first look at your data and the end product and decide whether or not they're going to make an offer to you to continue to develop that product. If they like it, it's great and they negotiate with you and you get to um, usually a large sum where they take on your company or just that product. But if they don't like it, what happens is then you are free to um, open up your marketing to other corporations, other biotechs, other pharma and give them an option to co-develop it with you or buy it or take over your company. So it's an option agreement. They get a first look, a right of first refusal. Debt financing. Debt financing is very attractive. It is essentially a loan. It's a small business loan. And in um, biotech, it is very common that in order to supplement you know, a series A or a series B round of funding, uh, people will take on debt you know, at the order of $5 million or some number. And um, that will help them pay for all the work that needs to be done until they can raise more money. The risk of debt financing is that it becomes a little bit of a, a boulder on your back that you're carrying throughout the whole development of the company. And we at Genosa did do debt financing and we spent a significant amount of time every year renegotiating our debt. 
we needed to, you know, you always want to get a better um, interest rate or better um, uh, fees or, you know, no risk to paying off your debt early. Typically, they need some kind of leverage. That means you sign over your intellectual property if you default, for example. I'm making, I mean, that's one option. Or they can march in and buy all of, or take over all of your equipment if you default on your loan. So there is usually some kind of leverage that goes with the debt financing. And then equity financing, again, is very common. This is your venture capitalist. This is your angel investors. This can be friends, family, fools, whoever wants to put money into your um, company. Um, usually they, you give them pieces of paper that are options with a valuation on them that are quite low, let's say 20 cents. And those options are purely theoretical in reality because the company isn't being traded publicly on the market. But what happens is if the company goes public and starts to sell on the stock market, and let's say you, um, your IPO is priced at $10 a share, your option for 20 cents um, has a huge return. You can, you can exercise your options, you can sell them, at $10 a share and make 980 profit per option. Any questions on my very high level definitions of sources of funding? I had a quick question about the uh, equitability of outsourcing the lab work. So it, it, it's, it seems like you would be... Oh. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Apologies, please. Because I was just, I was noticing the, the need of leverage for debt financing, but it, it's so much more equitable nowadays just to outsource the research. I mean, instead of buying that $200,000 product for, you know, a one year run of assays or something like that, you can just outsource it, but then you don't get the leverage. Is that one of the pros and cons to that? Or is it just kind of the whole field is going towards that outsourcing of lab work or not? Um, outsourcing is a double-edged sword. So, um, and, and the definition of outsourcing could be different. For example, we outsourced all of our manufacturing at our company, which meant that we paid a completely independent entity, a CDMO, to make our products on our behalf. And the challenges with that are your timelines are not your own. Often the smaller, you know, scrappy biotech can be much more efficient and both in time and capital than partnering with big entities in order to do that kind of work for you. Um, on the other hand, outsourcing, for example, for an animal facility to do all of your animal testing, because a lot of vaccine research or drug research does require animal testing, um, is very valuable because it is very challenging to build an animal facility, to regulate it, to find the qualified hands in order to do the work, et cetera. And so I think the answer is that there's pieces that are very valuable to outsource and there's pieces that are very valuable to keep for yourself, especially your timelines and your budget. Thanks. Sure. It's a good question. So how much do you raise? Unfortunately, I don't have a magic number for you, but it's always more than you think. So what you need to do to decide how much you need to raise is first identify the meaningful milestones that will reduce your risk. And I've listed six things here. There's a lot more that could be part of your list, but these are the things you have to think about. When you're starting a company, you have to put together your team. You have to license the technology. So that's part of what you can write into your milestones. That has to happen in order for you to be successful. You have to show proof of concept in animals, possibly. Humans are better. You have to find a world a world class CEO. And you know, CEOs don't usually volunteer their time. <laughs> and so they take it takes money in order to pay and attract that CEO. Um, positive clinical data is a big value inflection point for startup companies. Or sufficient data to attract a corporate partnership, because corporate partnerships can bring big dollars, but they might be virtual dollars. I mean, they call it bio bucks. They'll pay you 
X amount of dollars to do the work with the option or a promise that if you succeed, you'll get a, a milestone payment of Y, you know, so that's um, uh, one of the things to consider or becoming profitable. Uh, I don't think many in biotech, it's very rare that in the first round of financing, the biotech becomes profitable, but it can happen, especially for a platform company where, um, for example, if you're um, sequencing DNA and that you could be profitable very early. So anyway, you have to um, figure out how much time and money will be required to hit each of these things and then um, bring that amount to your potential investors in order to meet those goals and give you six months of runway after so that you can spend the time to raise your next tranche of money. And please keep in mind that at least half of venture money is spent usually on payroll, not cheap. And starting a company is a ton of work. I wrote five big buckets here, but there's usually a lot more. The first is there's investor due diligence. They will dig very deeply and really understand how novel your technology is, whether the industry cares, will they pay for it if you develop it? Will there be somebody there at the end of the day saying, yes, we want this? They will look at how long it takes to, print a pre uh, to clinical proof of concept. They will look at freedom to operate. They'll look in their patent um, database and say, does anybody else have patents that are infringing on this or that we're infringing on that would make it impossible for us if even if we develop this to actually sell it? The next is company creation. Who is going to be the CEO? Who is going to get the license for the patent? It took us eight months to negotiate the license to the technology that we um, took out of Harvard for Genosha. So you cannot underestimate how long the licensing negotiations will take. Team building, who are you gonna found the company with? Do you have SAB members ready? And it's very helpful if you're thinking about starting the company uh, in finding somebody else who has started a company to co-found with you. It is an example of what happened at Genosha and it's really super important. Because they've been there, they've done that, they have a reputation, they know the investors to call, they know the pitfalls to avoid. Financing, we just talked about it. How much do you need to get to a value creating event? How long until there's proof of concept in humans? And the answers to these questions can help you decide who do you go to um, in terms of like grants versus angel versus venture capitalists. And then beginning operations. Where are you gonna put your company? Do you have a trained, sale, uh, trained workforce wherever it's going to be who, who would be able to hit the ground running and start picking up on your science if you start that company? And as we were just talking about, it should it be virtual? Could you do it all outsourced or does it need to be bricks and mortar? Do you need to buy the equipment and have the laboratory in order to do the work that you wanna do? And so all of these have to be put in place to get your company off the ground. So Mark Twain said, keep away from people who try to belittle your ambitions. Small people always do that, but the really great make you feel that you too can become great. All right, so I'm gonna give you a little case study on Genosha, which is where I came from in the past 15 years. Uh, this is the same wheel I showed you before. And I am now back at 2006 when the company was founded. What was present? Well, they had a broad platform technology, which was um, rapid antigen discovery. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the next slide. They had three issued patents. And what um, Darren, the founder did that was really clever was that he wrote these patents um, in such a way that he didn't give away the farm. He did all of the work in a mouse model with a mouse pathogen and found mouse antigens things that weren't relevant to humans, but showed that the platform could be used in the way that he had described it in order to find human medicine. And that gave the investors a lot of comfort that this technology could be adapted, but it didn't start that clock ticking for how long we would have to practice using this platform um, for human subject research 
and then have it run out and let somebody genericize it. He had early proof of concept in mice uh, with chlamydia trachomatis antigen. Um, so they used the Atlas platform, that's what the platform was called, to find novel antigens that hadn't been described before. And antigens are the targets of the immune response. And then vaccinated mice with those new antigens that they found and then challenged them with the bacteria and proved that the mice didn't get disease or they had ameliorated disease. Um, he's a Harvard Medical School professor. It doesn't matter where this idea comes from. Again, the visionary means that you created this thing and you have a vision for how it can grow into a company and benefit others. They just had a publication in PNAS. They have other publications as well, but that was the kind of tipping point for them in terms of getting um, the investors interested. And importantly, they had early interest from corporate and nonprofits including PATH and the Gates Foundation, Pharma, the Department of Defense. So all of these culminated in him being ready and the company getting founded in August of 2006. So the unique technology was a cellular immunology idea for vaccines. So up until that time point, all of the existing vaccines that have been created had focused on antibody-mediated responses, so B-cell immunity. But there were a whole bunch of pathogens that remained where vaccines have failed, nobody could figure out how to treat them, and it's because often the pathogen would hide once it got in the body inside of cells. And when it does that, the only type of cells in the immune system that could see it and kill it are T cells which detect things that are hiding inside of your cells. And so this platform was a way where we could interrogate every single protein that makes up a pathogen or every single mutation that makes up a cancer with T cells from an individual and ask them what they made responses to naturally. And then we could create a vaccine based on that information. And so that was what this was. Again, we called it platform, uh, called it Atlas. It stood for antigen lead acquisition system. <laughs> Basically, you take cohorts of people, people who were exposed to a pathogen, let's say um, herpes, which was our lead target. So you have a, people who were infected and they suffer from outbreaks repeatedly, or you have people who were exposed through an infected partner but never got sick and never got infected themselves. You screen individually each of their T cells against all of the proteins that make up the virus. And you say, what did these people who got sick see? And what did these people who didn't get sick see? And then you choose the ones that are unique to the healthy population and create your vaccine using that. So this was really novel. Nobody had done it before. Um, we thought that it was very rapid and we could find new targets for human immunology. Why do investors care? This is the reason. This is actually recent data, but I could have um, superimposed a graph from 2006 over this and it would be the same thing. The global vaccines market has just been increasing year over year. And now, especially with COVID, it has been increasing even more. And the drivers of that are um, innovation, new products, right? So this was a new innovation. This was a new way to find a vaccine that could be sold and benefit global. We have become a global economy. And so all of these developing countries, they're called the BRIC countries, the markets, um, could be included in your um, estimates for where you could sell your vaccine. And there just were more M&A uh, mergers and acquisitions happening where big farmer were buying small vaccine companies and money going into vaccine companies at the time. So we knew that there was a market there and that vaccines were important and they built a great origination team. The team had a track record of building biotechnology companies. Together they had founded more than 20. And what's really interesting, it's, it's very incestuous, this world, because if you look at like some of the exits that were there, so they had ID Biomedical that was acquired by GSK. They had a, a Chiron that was acquired by Novartis. 
And then they had Powder Deck, which was acquired by Chiron. So everybody eats each other, <laughs> but it's a good ecosystem because success brings success and you continue to build something that the bigger companies want to have. And I think you'll recognize some of the co-founders companies um, on the list there. And then they also had a really good scientific advisory board with over 160 years of combined vaccine experience from Wyeth, Merck, Intercell in Europe, NIH, Harvard, so it's really diverse population of individuals who are experts in their field, including um, people who had developed Prevnar and Gardasil, who, which at the time were the best selling vaccines in history. Okay, so we knew the team, we knew that the, there was um, capital that could be invested, but then we had to narrow down our disease. How do we go from huge markets of things that we could treat to the ones that are tenable for us to approach. And um, this is the kind of funnel that we use. Is there a market that's important? You wanna be able to sell it at the end of the day and make money back based on um, however many years and how many millions of dollars we spent to develop that product. We had to know whether we had a technical advantage. The advantage of Atlas was that it could screen large um, libraries of potential antigens if your pathogen only had seven open reading frames, you could do what we do in a different way and you wouldn't need the Atlas technology. Um, the third was the time to clinic and more importantly, the time through clinic, because sometimes you could get to the clinic really fast, but then your licensure study, the thing that's going to get you your BLA application takes 10 years to run. And that's um, unattractive to investors. <laughs> and then feasibility, could we do it? And where we landed was um, four targets, an infectious disease space, herpes, chlamydia, pneumococcus, and malaria. So at the time Genosha was founded, this was what it looked like. We had the potential for a $5 billion market for a large genome viral target, which had near-term proof of concept. And the reason that we went after the herpes therapy first was our phase one study could have an efficacy component because we were treating patients who were already infected and sick with the virus. And so we could see if there was a benefit right away. That helped. We then had the non-viral intracellular pathogen, chlamydia. Um, the reason that chlamydia became important was that no other way could you screen this bacteria all of the proteins that exist in the bacteria to find out what the targets of T cells were. So that made our technology really shine. The third was the pneumo program, streptococcus pneumonia. This we funded with grant money because it was a huge, high risk, novel hypothesis that you could create something, a special kind of T cell called a TH17 cell that would reside in the nose and prevent the bacteria from colonizing the nose. Because if you prevent colonization, you prevent infection. And if you prevent infection, you prevent disease, which is what makes people sick. So too high risk for investors. It was a novel mechanism, a novel principle, but could change the game if successful and open up the whole hospital infection market. So it's why we chose to go after it and it's why we chose to pay for it non-dilutively. And then emerging pathogens, we went with um, Plasmodium falciparum, the parasite that causes malaria. It's important in the developing world and it really showed the strength of what Atlas can do. So what was our path? No, I'm not gonna read this to you. Please don't panic. But there's important things to point out. And I only did until 2020. Fundraising is really key component. Non-dilutive funding grants for things that aren't our core products. We non-dilutively funded um, the pneumococcal program, the malaria program, and a cancer program using tumor associated antigens. We also had three rounds of venture funding. We had a Series A in 2009, a Series B in 2011, a Series C in 2012, and then we went public in 2014. And you can see how the capital required to run these businesses really grows with success. In 2015, we did two public offerings and raised about $100 million. And that was already spent by 2018. <laughs> so the point is, it takes a lot of capital to be successful in biotech. 
Publications are the key to credibility. Patents are the key to protecting the assets. When I was in academia, I heard that I shouldn't go into industry because I wouldn't be able to publish. Nobody publishes. It's not true. It's important to publish in, in industry. It is independent verification of your work. However, you have to be careful that you file your patent applications before you publish. Because if you publish those data before you file your patent application, the US Patent and Trademark Office will call it prior art, say it's in the public domain, and therefore it's not um, an invention. It's, it's known commonly. As I already mentioned, collaborations are the key to credibility and a way to share the workload. Um, the contracts are tricky. You need good lawyers. And it, again, it isn't because anyone's malicious. It's just because the universities or the nonprofits have to protect their assets and their intellectual property, as do you. And so you just have to find the way to be able to work together and make um, the program successful. Next, you have to understand that you can have great and reproducible clinical data and the path to approval and still not be able to take the product to the market. In 2017, we were phase three ready for our herpes immunotherapy, and we needed to raise the money to do the phase three trial, and we could not raise the money. And so we had to recapitalize the company, refocus it entirely from infectious diseases to cancer, because that's where the money was being spent in that time frame. And so it was really unfortunate and um, a little bit disappointing, but you know the company lived on because we had a great platform that could be applied to immuno-oncology. But just because it died in 2017 doesn't mean it's dead. <laughs> and in fact, in 2020, um, Shinogi took a option license, a license option to the Gen 3 herpes immunotherapy. And so it just got put on the shelf for a little while until the timing was right for someone else to come along and want to um, invest in that program. And in fact, just last week, a new company was announced called Vianova Therapeutics. Um, they took the antivirals that were mothballed by Nova Novartis um, just because of market forces and, um, and created a whole new company of it. So Investment uh, assets aren't necessarily dead, even if you can't find a way to develop them yourself. And Genosha closed its doors permanently in 2022, which was um, really unfortunate. And again, I think a little bit of the whims of the market um, and timing and COVID and everything else. But I'm really proud of what we accomplished over 15 years. We have an amino, we had an immunotherapy to treat genital herpes that is phase three ready. We had a uh, pneumococcal vaccine, the one that I talked about preventing colonization in the nose that we took through a phase two challenge trial. That's pretty amazing. You can vaccinate patients, challenge them in the nose with the bacteria and then do nasal lavages, you know, like the neti pot and see whether or not they got colonized. It was a really amazing trial. Um, we had animal proof of concept in both herpes and in chlamydia. We had novel antigens that we found in malaria. And then when we switched to immuno-oncology, we had a personalized cancer vaccine uh, that is phase two ready. And we had a cell therapy, a personalized T cell therapy uh, that was closed or the company was closed in the midst of its phase one study. So lots of good stuff there. So I'm gonna wrap up with a couple of slides on what the investors in pharma care about. Um, this is again, my opinion, and you probably have different opinions depending on who you talk to. But oncology right now is still the biggest market. It is where the most dollars are going. Um, you can see it's a big purple gap here. <laughs> And then there's other uh, things within the space that are really, I think, technically important. Um, vaccines, which is where we were playing for quite some time, is somewhere in the middle of the top 10. But there's all kinds, antivirals, antihypertensive, diabetes. There's a lot of opportunity where there's still a lot of growth and that the market would be um, a huge for you to continue to develop your products in those spaces. 
The challenge is biotech's in the free fall. And I wanna be very careful because I mean the public biotech market. And um, this is, I'm not gonna read the quote to you, but um, one of the venture capitalists from Atlas Ventures who writes a blog, it's a great blog, you should look it up. It's called Life's IVC. That, um, and this was from last year, but not that far ago. Um, it's biotech Armageddon. Companies are losing valuation. Companies are closing. Genosha was one of the um, uh, casualties of this. And there's just a massive sell-off. The, the markets were kind of in the toilet. Um, so it's pretty disappointing. However, we're not talking about the public markets. In fact, the biotech ecosystem, the private biotech is really solid. The venture capitalists, as I mentioned, many of them have you know, half a billion dollar funds or bigger. And so they have money to put to work for the companies in which they invest. Um, and I made this slide last year, so it's, it's a little outdated, but not really. I mean, 2022 had the largest start for private financing than every year except for the year before it. And the investments are in these platform technologies as well as oncology and IO. And so there's a lot of capital to be put to work in biotech if you have the um, invention and the drive to start a company, I think you could be okay. And so as Oscar Wilde said, things may come to those who wait, but only things left by those who hustle. I encourage you all to go out there and hustle <laughs> and start your company. Um, and it's challenging, but it's rewarding. And I think the keys for biotech are good science and intellectual property that's protected a good team, good financial support. You always need more money than you think you need. A little serendipity, it's real. You can have the best idea, but sometimes it's just about luck and a lot of hard work. So that's all I had for you today. Uh, I am happy to answer any questions uh, that you'd like to ask. I've been amazed at how, how low. Yeah. Yeah, I've been amazed at how quickly vials are made up for COVID and so forth. And in other words, they have to be there to meet the demand. How much money goes into manufacturing in large, quick scales versus how much was spent on R&D to get there? Manufacturing is one of the biggest cost drivers for biotech or pharma. It is, I would say, 10x research budget once you get into scale. Um, and wow. I'll, give you a, I'll give you an example. For our vaccine, just it was a recombinant protein vaccine. So it means that we created um, big vats of um, bacula virus cells that were expressing the proteins and then you purify it. Just to do your phase one trial, you have to make three of these 10,000 liter fermentations and purifications to show that you can do it consistently and that you get the same looking product every time. And that was just the practice. That is huge expense because you're paying for all the reagents and the purification columns and the staff and the paperwork and everything just for the practice one. And then for your real ones, um, once you start creating your manufacturing lot, every single lot that you make has to go on stability and sterility. So you keep them for 10 years and you have people testing them every month or every six months in order to make sure that they're okay. So there's a huge, huge investment that goes into manufacturing and clinical trials. Clinical trials are expensive. 